Welcome to Worship at Christ Church. I'm David Hall. I'm one of the pastors here. It's so good to see you all who are here in person, and it's great to know that we have people worshiping with us at home. Welcome to you as well. This Saturday is the annual work day at Camp Lookout, and they have a lot of work that needs to be done. If you can help with this, we're going to start up at the camp at 730, and the work day will end at 3. If you'd like more information, you can go to our website and just go ahead and sign up while you're there. Next Sunday, we're going to have a walking tour of our church buildings following each of the worship services. You will uh, meet out at the information desk here by the sanctuary at the end of the service and be taken on the tour. As you go on that, you'll also learn about uh, small groups. You'll learn a little bit about our history. You'll learn about ways that you can serve here at Christ Church. The season of Lent opens with a new sermon series on March 6th. We'd like you to see a video preview of that series. I saw a post on Facebook just this week. One of our members had posted, we're uh, reviewing our mission at Christ Church, and part of our mission is to invite others. So I'm inviting all of you, my friends, if you're not in a service. She happens to be in the 1115 Contemporary Service, and she says, I'll come early and meet you at the door. Now, that's a wonderful invitation. I invite you all to do the same thing. I also invite you to register your attendance. There's a blue attendance pad on the back of the seat uh, closest to the aisle. If you're closest to that, if you would take out that pad and register attendance. You guys here in person can register on our church app if you prefer to do that. And for those of you at home, it's required that you use the app. That's your best way of registering and letting us know that you're with us. Please do that whenever or whichever day you worship. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to Children's Moment. I'm Mary Beth Hammett, the Children's Ministry Director at Christ, and I'm so glad that you're here today. Kids, gather around, and let's just chat for a minute. I have a few things with me today. Who knows what this is? Yeah, of course you do. It's a cross. Now, we see crosses in lots of different ways. It could be like this one, a keychain, or a bookmark, or even really pretty cross that you hang on your wall. We see them everywhere, on churches, on buildings. Even some people, you'll see them on their skin. They use them as a tattoo. So what does the cross mean to you? Is it just jewelry or a piece of art? Or does it mean something more deeper? You know, this cross represents Jesus and what he did for us, that he died for us and he lives again to save us from our sins. And because of that, we can be his followers and be part of the big plan that God has to share that news with everyone we meet. So this week, when you see a cross, just remember, this shows that Jesus loves us so much and that we need to share that love with others. Thank you. I'll see you next time.
Amen. And now it's your turn to stand and sing or worship the King as we worship together. Good morning. Thank you for your wonderful worship and songs and praises and music. And you can worship in your service in the life of the church as well. And today we are highlighting our service in a particular area. It's a ministry group called Needle Arts for Service. And it's a group that makes handcrafted items by members of the church and members of the community. And they produced these things here now. Prayer shawls, scarves, washcloths, prayer patches, and lap quilts that they give out to people in, in our community. And I had the privilege of meeting with them in January as they began their new year of service and ministry to give prayers and dedication over some of the things they had created. And I walked in the room, and I said, oh, is this the whole year's work? And they said, oh, no, that's just been the last couple of months. And I was amazed and so impressed with the beautiful stories they shared of how these items go out to so many people to give comfort and care in our community. They will receive, I checked with them this morning, they will receive, if you have fabric in your homes that you planned to sew but never did, they'll receive that and use it for gifts for people out in the community or yarn. And so you can just let, let them know and go on the church website to find out more if you'd like to get involved with that group. This is our time in our worship where we give into the Lord of our tithes and offerings. And thank you for being a generous church. There are many ways you can give. You can give on the church app. You may give online. You may give as you exit from the sanctuary. Or you may give by dropping it off at the church office or mailing it in. All of these are acts of worship. Now, let us bow in prayer as we also worship. Loving and gracious God, we praise you for your faithfulness in the sunshine and the rain. As I saw the red, bur red buds on the red bud tree emerging today, oh, how much hope it gives in my heart as spring is coming. But we know it's a weather prediction. There's rain this week too. Let us remember to praise you in the sunshine and the rain because it is a gift of your provisions for this earth. You also provide for us in so many ways that we take for granted. 
So help us to live with thankful hearts and an attitude of gratitude with each day of our lives. We thank you that you hear our prayer request. You hear our great prayer request as the tensions arise between Russia and the Ukraine that you will give your peace into that situation and help the nations as we talk together to avoid war at any time. Help us also in our home conflicts and our community conflicts to grant your peace in those situations as well. We lift up to you those who need you in special and particular ways, who are grieving in the depths of their souls that need your comfort and your peace. We pray for those who are experiencing surgeries and medical issues, that you will work with the doctors and nurses and medicines and machines and therapists and researchers to bring your healing power into their lives. Help us to live faithfully unto you and as the hymns sing, oh, for grace to trust you more. So let us trust you with every step of our lives as Pastor Nathan preaches here about our faithfulness in our life of faithful discipleship. Help us to live with the assurance that your Holy Spirit will enable us each step of the way. We thank you for the gift of prayer. We pray now together the prayer you continue to teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It was October 2nd, 1977, the day of the last regular season baseball game for the Los Angeles Dodgers that year. Dusty Baker had just hit a historic home run. It was his 30th home run of the season, and it allowed the Dodgers to be the first team in history to have four of their players hit 30 or more home runs in one season. Now, for those of you who are Atlanta Braves fans, a little quick side note of trivia there. A few years earlier, uh, Dusty was part of the Braves, and he was on deck when Hank Aaron hit his historic home run to pass Babe Ruth. And last summer, the Braves came within three home runs by one of their players of accomplishing this same feat of four players hitting 30 or more during one season. I know most of you didn't come to worship for Atlanta Braves trivia, so we'll move on. <laughs> Back to Los Angeles in 1977. Dusty Baker had just hit his home run. He'd rounded the bases. He'd crossed home plate. He'd headed back for the Dodger dugout. And near the dugout stood his rookie teammate, Glenn Burke, with his hand up. It was kind of an awkward moment. In, in, the, in the emotion of the moment, Dusty slapped his hand. I think we've got a picture of it here. There it is. According to the articles I read, it is believed to be that was the first high five. Now, Chances are people had done that somewhere, you know, in other settings before. But in that setting, in that moment, in that emotional moment, it's like it lit a fire. It started a trend, and it became the way to celebrate with somebody, uh, a teammate, a friend, whoever. It became a way, and it caught on. I remember I was playing in high school sports during that time, and I remember it catching on. I remember watching sporting events and that catching on. And over the years, I've given many a high five to teammates and to family members and friends. I've been at sporting events where um, – People around me, we were all cheering for the same team. A good thing happened. I didn't even know these people. I'm high-fiving everybody around us. It's just the way we celebrate a lot of times in those kind of moments. Before this day is over, I invite you to give a high-five to at least one person that you celebrate being in your life. All right? Not right now. Not right now. Sometime today. However, today, I want to use those two words. I want to use that phrase in a totally different way. Anytime somebody joins our church, anytime somebody joins any United Methodist church, we ask them this question. 
Will you faithfully participate in its mem- uh, ministries with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? I like to say that is the way we define what it means to live out our discipleship of Jesus Christ in and through his church. It's what it looks like to be the people of Christ. It is, um, it's, it's to state a high level of expectation that we take seriously being a part of the church, being a disciple of Jesus. So today I'm calling this five the high five. Prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. This month, we're focusing on our new way of stating our unchanging mission. Can you say it with me again? Learning to live the way of Jesus Christ and inviting all to follow him. You've done well on that. The way You see, the way of Jesus is not just an individual way. It's not just me and Jesus doing our thing. It's it's not me being limited by my own understanding of Jesus. His way and what it means to live into God's mission and learn this way of Jesus. No, Jesus calls us all into community to not just do an individual thing with Jesus, but to do it together, to be his people together. So we do that by faithfully participating with our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. I want to take a look at each of those this morning and uh, attach a Bible verse or story that that I'm attaching to them, at least for this day. First and foremost is prayer. The people of Christ are to be a people of prayer. He certainly was. When Jesus was among us here on this earth, he was in constant conversation with his heavenly father. When he chose the inner circle of 12 disciples from all of his disciples, he prayed all night. The scripture says he prayed all night before he made those those choices. Prayer was a vital part of his life while he was here on earth. And if it was a vital part of his life, should it not be a vital part of our life as his people? However, the Bible verse that I've chosen to connect with prayer today comes from the Old Testament. It comes from the book of Daniel. We're told there of the story of when the people of Judah were defeated by the Babylonians and carried off to exile Uh, Many of the people of Judah had to leave their homeland and were were taken to to Babylon. Daniel was one of those. He was one among many young men who was chosen by the king and his officials to serve in the king's court. And Daniel, over time, had found favor with the king. At one point, the king was going to appoint 120 leaders to lead various sections of his kingdom. And over those 120, there would be three administrators— So that was going to be their leadership structure. And Daniel was going to be one of those three. He was going to be the leader of those three administrators. He was going to oversee the whole thing. Well, apparently those other administrators and all those other leaders didn't care for that. They didn't much like Daniel. They were jealous of Daniel. And so they tried to dig up dirt, find some dirt on Daniel to get him out of favor with the king. Couldn't find anything. So they conspired went to the king, and they said, King, we think you need to make sure that everybody in this kingdom is loyal to you. You need to make a rule that anybody that prays to any other god or any other person other than you for 30 days will be thrown into the den of lions. King liked the sound of that. Hey, I want, I, I do, we do need to make sure everybody's loyal to me. So he made that rule. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 comes next in the story. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. If you don't know the rest of the story, I invite you, not now, but later today, go find Daniel 6, read the rest of the story. It's a fascinating story. Daniel was devoted to prayer no matter what. Even when it turned out that this rule was made and his life was going to be in danger, he was still devoted to his God in prayer. I invite you to be devoted to your Lord in prayer, no matter what, to make this a way of life. And, and maybe you're already doing that in some way, but is there, are there ways that you could take that to another level? Stay in conversation 
with God. I would invite you to consider just as a practical way to maybe create some new habits or help make that happen. We'll connect it to this focus on the number five today. What would it look like for you to pray five times a day? When you get up in the morning, when you eat your three meals, when you go to bed at night. Those don't have to be lengthy prayers, but at least they keep the line open. Hopefully they would help create that habit of keeping that conversation, that open line with God. And when you pray, pray for your church. I mean, that's what we're focused here today. Pray for your church. Pray for church leaders. Pray for pastors. Pray for uh, other staff, for other leaders in the church, for teachers in the church. Pray for ministries in the life of our church. We're focused on our strategic plan right now. You can pray as we discern God's uh, guidance in that and through that over the next few years. You can pray on, for the church on all kinds of different levels. There's church beyond this place and even this denomination. So pray for the church everywhere, but particularly pray for Christ church regularly. Pray for us to better and better be the people of Christ more than anything. All right, the second of the high five is presence. I offer here a couple of verses from the New Testament letter of the Hebrews. It was written back in the first century to encourage people of that time, Christians of that time, to stay faithful, to stay devoted to their Lord. And in chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, we read, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, but encouraging one another. It is so important to our life together as the people of Christ that we be present with each other as much as possible. Surely we've experienced that in the last two years. Those many times when we couldn't be together, we knew of that need. We felt that need to be with others. Um, and for health reasons, there are still some who cannot be with us on campus or together in small groups, uh, whether for worship or for whatever else. But as you are able and when you can, I encourage you to do that as much as possible. Now, let me quickly add how thankful and delighted I am that God has blessed us with the technology to be able to offer worship and other small group gatherings online. Uh, and I'm certainly thankful for the people who can uh, manage that technology. We welcome everyone who participates with us online, whether at the time of the service or other gathering or at some other time. And I invite all of us to use that technology when you need it. It's there for a reason. It's there for good use. And we all need that at times. We need to, to chill at times. We need to just stay at home at times and chill. And yet we still want to stay connected. So use that technology when you need to use it. However, I strongly encourage you, as you are able and as you can, don't let that take the place of gathering with other Christians as much as you can. We really do need each other, and we depend on each other. And you are missed when you're not a part of that. Third on our list of the high five is our gifts. We give from our financial resources to support this shared ministry of our Lord. And I want to emphasize that. Uh, sometimes we get to thinking in the church, uh, I'm giving to support the church budget. Or I'm giving to the church. Well, in a sense, that's true. But on a much bigger level, where we emphasize this is we give to God. We're, what, what we give, we're giving because God has blessed us with resources and we return those to God to be a part of, to worship, as, as Debbie was saying earlier, but also to, to say thank you to God and to want to support the ministry and work of our Lord. The biblical principle or teaching on this subject is the tithe, that we give 10% of our income, 10% of our resources to the Lord's work. I want, the Bible verse that I'm connecting to that today is Luke 11:42. In, in this spot, Jesus is affirming the tithe while at the same time reprimanding some religious leaders of the time who were so caught up in those kinds of disciplines in their life that they weren't doing the more important work of the Lord. And here's how he stated it. Woe to you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have... Let me add here that the Bible 
to a life of generosity, that that 10% is just the first goal toward living this life of generosity of this generous God we worship. Now, let me also quickly add that if you're struggling financially, do not let this subject of giving be a burden to you. In, this, in these last couple of years, people have lost their jobs. People are struggling to make ends meet themselves, of their family. God does not seek to be a burden to you, so don't let it be such. But I also want to acknowledge that all down through history and still today, some of the most generous people are those who we, most of us, would consider economically poor. You see, it's not the amount of money or resources you have that determines whether you're generous or not. So give as you're able. Give generously, and you will be blessed. The fourth of the five is service. In chapter 10 of the Gospel according to Mark, Jesus is teaching his disciples a key lesson about what it means to be a disciple, what it means to to follow him and be devoted to him. And, And he says that they must be willing to serve to be a servant. And then referring even to himself, he says in verse 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. You see, this area of service refers to your ministry. Again, sometimes we get to thinking that, oh, the ministers are the pastors. They do the work of ministry. But no, the ministry is is shared by all of us as the church. So, If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a part of his church, you have a ministry area. You have a a way that God has gifted you to serve in the life of the church. So we encourage you to have at least one area of service, one service that you do within the life of the church, and one service or ministry that you do on behalf of the church out into the community and beyond. We have a listing online and in print that will help you with that if you're searching for what that might be. It's titled Christ Church Ministry Opportunities. So I invite you to go look that. We have those uh, here at the information desk outside the sanctuary today. Uh, anytime during the week, pick up one in the office if you're watching online and want a printed copy, or you can go online to our website and find that. I encourage you to go find that, look that over. It is extensive, and I appreciate the staff that's been working on that the last month. Uh, we'll be developing it as we go. And, and if you don't find anything on there, maybe there's some other way that you're already serving and there's a place to write that in. If you don't see something listed, you say, well, here's the way I serve in the church. Here's, the, here's how I serve out in the community on behalf of my Lord. So write that in. Um, but as you look it over, I encourage you not to just look from a standpoint of saying, okay, what, what am I interested in? What would I like to do? Could be that. More importantly, I invite you to pray over it. And ask God, what are you calling me to do? What would you have me do in service to your mission, your ministry, in this place and beyond this place? Hopefully by the end of March, I would be able to walk up to any member of Christ Church and ask, so what's your ministry at Christ Church? And you could quickly say, well, I do this within the church and I do this outside the church to serve others. Number five on the high, uh, high five is witness. In the first chapter of the book of Acts, Jesus says something to his disciples that I believe was meant for disciples ever since then. He said, you shall be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. He told us to start with people and territory that we're most familiar with, but then work our way out from there to people everywhere, to anybody we meet, anytime, any place wherever we have the opportunity that we can tell about him and what he means to us. Yes, let the way you live your life speak for you, but don't limit your speaking to that. I want to say that again. You know, sometimes people say, well, I, I don't have a lot to say, but, but I try to let the way I live my life speak for what I believe in and what's important to me. That's a good thing. Keep doing that. It's good. It ought to be the way. That ought to be the case for all of us, that the way we live our life says something to people, and they they want to know why we live that way. Yes, let the way you live your life speak for you, but don't limit your speaking to that. You still need to tell about your faith. They need to know people that respect you, people that look up to you, people that are watching you, 
they need to hear why you're living this way. Tell them about your faith. Tell them about your spiritual life. Tell them about your church. Tell them about Jesus and what Jesus means to you in your life. Remember the last part of that mi- our mission statement, inviting all to follow him. Prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. I'm calling it the high five of what it means to live out our discipleship for Jesus Christ in and through his church. Of your lives, anytime you see somebody else or you see somebody giving a high five, and you see somebody giving a high five, I hope you'll think about this high five and your part doing your part as we seek to be the people of Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the opportunity, the absolute privilege to be a part of your mission. We are humbled to think that that we can do anything that would further your mission, and yet you call us, you call all of us, you invite all of us to be your partner in ministry. Uh, to serve the needs of others, to help others come to know you. So guide us. We, we have this particular way that we believe uh, helps us be specific and to live into that. So guide us in that. Continue to teach us, show us how that we can better um, be present with each other, that we can be devoted to prayer and keeping a conversation open with you, that we can give generously from our resources for your mission that we can serve you in some specific way that you've gifted us to do and you've called us to do, and certainly that we let others know about you any way we can. Continue to teach us to be your people. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus be the center of It really is all about Jesus. What we do, who we are, we are his people. We believe that in order to live into this, to grow in this, it, it, it's so important to have that. Yes, we're called together, but it's so important to have that personal relationship with Jesus. And so we invite you to either begin that relationship, if you haven't started that relationship, or deepen that relationship. Be intentional about constantly deepening that relationship. And if you're looking for a church to unite with, in order to better do that, know that you're welcome here at Christ Church. As we, there's some, for those of you watching online, there's contact information for Pastor David. He would welcome a text or a phone call, love to help you get connected. Uh, for those of you in the room, we're going to sing a, a final hymn. We invite those of you online to join us in singing that. It is a hymn that I remember when our United Methodist hymnal first came out. It became so very popular, and it became one of my favorites and continues to be, and it's very fitting for what this sermon and this uh, emphasis for today is. Let's stand and join in singing. Here.
know that as you go, he will lead you. If you've got that conversation going, if you're seeking this Holy Spirit who is God to guide you, that Spirit will guide you. Go seek to be the people of Christ. Know that he goes with you to guide you, to lead you. Hold those people in your heart. Amen? God bless you. Have a great week. Bring a car load next week. With everything going on in the world right now, it is so easy to feel alone, to feel isolated.